All right, Courtney, we are back. Second time guest. That doesn't always happen for a lot of people. Second time guest on the network. Oh, no way. No, <laughs> definitely not. Um, but we had such a good conversation last time. I thought it was really interesting and I uh, felt like we needed to continue that conversation. You know? Yeah, I love it. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, my pleasure. What's life been like as of late? It's been a little bit since our last time we chatted. Has been a few months. Life has been good. Still staying strong with my podcast. Mm -hmm. I'm at like 52 episodes, which I know you're way beyond that, <laughs> but it's pretty exciting. Um, really getting past the first 10, I think is like yeah. exciting because then you get momentum, you know, but otherwise enjoying the summer, getting outside a lot, you know, hanging out with friends. It's been hot, but it's been yeah. nice. Good, good. You know, podcasting is interesting. I think you get past, I guess there's a stat about pod fading. Most people don't last past their first seven episodes. Oh, and um, seven. I guess it's like a gigantic amount of people don't last past the seven. Like it's more often than not that people quit it very early. So you've gotten you, over the that phase, you know. The hump, the first hump, and maybe a second and third hump. Do you think that's <laughs> because they don't get... Um, enough momentum fast enough, like not enough people listening right away, not enough interaction. Uh, I think they, it's several things. Don't. I think that's probably one of them. I think the other thing is a lot of people don't realize how much work it is. Oh, yeah, and they realize, oh, there's a lot of work, especially if you're just doing it yourself. And I think sometimes people go, I'm going to edit this a certain way. I want it to have it to like really be great, which is awesome. But it's a real time uh, consumption deal. And then I think, um, yeah, what's the return on investment? Like, what's your expectation for the return on investment? I think that's difficult for people. You know? Yeah, and monetizing is awesome, but it takes a long time to figure that out. I haven't yet. I mean, that's like 90% of podcasts have not figured that out yet. Yeah, it's hard. It's like, do yeah. you approach them? Do they approach you? What's a good fit? You can't just do everybody. Yeah. I've had like many experiences with monetization on podcasts, and most of them are just okay. And I think it's essentially the haves and have nots. It's like the upper 1% of people who are essentially celebrities who are making a lot of money. And then there's most other people who are maybe they have some programmatic ads running here and there, so, but it's like nothing. It, it, it amounts to almost nothing. So, yep. I mean, I think the dream would be just to have it pay for itself, like the yeah. subscriptions and stuff. Right. It's <laughs> difficult. I, you know, I, yep. I never started mine to monetize. Um, I just like talking to people. Yep. Um, yep. I do that's like kind of the lane money. I've fallen into. Yeah. yeah. I mean, money's nice, but <laughs> yeah. I have a full-time job, so that's okay. Yeah. Me too. I don't think, I think a lot of people wanted to be a lead generator for uh, their business and things of that nature. So it's almost a marketing tool. For some people yep. as well, you know. That makes sense. What are you, uh, so what have you experienced in this, these 50 plus episodes? What are the highs? What are the lows? The highs have been learning a lot about myself. And I started this partly because I love to talk to people. Um, the whole, like, you're not qualified. I love to get into people's brains and what makes them tick. But I also started it because I need that reminder all the time myself that I can do things that I didn't do before. I can pursue things that I didn't pursue before because I don't have the background in it or I'm afraid of it. I can just set that stuff aside and do it because there's so many other people that are struggling in the same ways mm -hmm. and they're still figuring out how to do it anyways. And that's everybody I talk to is so inspirational. And it does feel like they have some sort of ticket that they found somewhere to life that I haven't found yet. And I'm like still trying to find it, which they probably don't agree. They're like, we're all in this <laughs> journey together. Like none of us have it figured out. That's yeah. part of your podcast, Courtney. But <laughs> I, it does feel like, it feels like these people are so amazingly adept and so, um, so qualified in ways that they just don't see. And I think that's just an amazing thing to pick apart with people. And I just love doing it. And they sometimes have, re you know, realizations within the episode and they're like, I didn't ever like think about it this way, but I actually did some really cool shit um, yeah, <laughs> or what yeah. have you. But, uh, and the struggles are 
I think last time we spoke, it was like editing kind of mm-hmm. is difficult. I've gotten that a little more dialed, so that's nice. Um, social media, I was really inspired by you saying that you really only focus on LinkedIn. And so I've been kind of just honing in on one platform, and that's Instagram for me. And then sometimes I'll dabble in the other ones, and that's taken off a lot of pressure. Yeah. So that was really great. Um, but yeah. honestly, that's the major struggle is trying to balance my time because um, I – this isn't a full-time thing and it's like yeah. a really cool hobby, but I don't have a ton of time for it. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember us talking about that and I, since then I've had many conversations about that topic of social media and I feel like there's kind of this collective pressure to use all these different things and they're all going through these different uh, transformations and stuff. And mm-hmm. I'm just like, I don't know. My thing is like, no one's great at everything. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're like just doing like 12 things, you're probably pretty average to below average at most of them. You haven't spent most a lot of time like like a mastery of something requires a really deep dive and a lot of repetition. You can only give that to so many things for that. Isn't it like 10,000 hours or something like that? Yeah, you Malcolm Gladwell coined that. Yeah, the yeah. 10,000 hours of doing something. So, I mean, who's going to give that much time to like 12, you know, six, seven, eight, nine things? Like, I just, and I just see more people just not very interested in social media. Like, I feel like there's a lot of exhaustion. Yeah. And that exhaustion, I think, is still, there's still people on it, quite a bit of people on it, but I don't, I think they're rethinking how they should appear on these things. Um, yep. I agree with that. And in what medium, in what way, right? Yeah. Cause there's so many things like reels, they say do reels because yeah. that's where all of the engagement in the audience is now, but reels takes time. Reels takes creative energy. Um, and then now there's threads and people are like, you got to get on threads. Cause that's where all the new people are. And you can <laughs> get like so much traction. Cause you're one of the new ones. It's yeah, it's pretty, it's the wild west out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was like podcasting. Like, I feel like now everyone I know has a podcast almost. And it's like, yeah. so it's like you, everybody follows stuff. And I'm just, I'm always just like, all right, I got to like, see this. Like, mm-hmm. is this serving me or not? You know, mm-hmm. and if I'm going to do it, let me just pick one thing and let me like really just focus on that and just deal with the fact that I'm not on the other stuff. <laughs> yeah. Know? I'm curious in what ways your podcast serves you. Like what lights you up about it? I just think it's the same thing. I've always had a podcast. It just wasn't in a format of a podcast. You know, like me, like yesterday, I met with one of my podcast guests actually in person for the first time. Cool. Uh, Bara Man. Big shout out to Bara. She moved from California to Colorado uh, just for a few months. And I said, oh, we're like 45 minutes from each other now. So we went and had an awesome lunch, had a very deep conversation. And uh, then she's probably coming up this way at some point to meet with me again. So that's what I like about it. It's just meeting people and getting the chance uh, to do that. And I think if you you take it at least from that approach, you're meeting people, it does take a lot of the pressure off on the other things. Um, So that's what gives me a lot of joy with it. I just use it as a vehicle to meet people. And hopefully if they're near me or I'm in their city, then we can actually meet each other. Yeah. Which city in Colorado did you land in? I'm in uh, Windsor, so right outside of Fort Collins. Oh, okay. uh, Northern Colorado. Yeah, it's it's amazing. It's uh, really beautiful. So, yeah, it was like 45 minutes to Boulder. Uh, down, and I mean, that was amazing, too. So, I mean, it's an incredibly beautiful state. Just like it Washington. Really Washington's is. beautiful, too. I mean, yeah. Uh, I know those 14ers. I want to go climb all of them. <laughs> the 14ers, right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I'm interested, like with uh, you're not qualified, what is the kind of the upside and downside of having so much information, let's say like YouTube to teach you how to do things or search, search engines to teach you how to do things that you're not qualified? What's the good and maybe the challenging part of that, of having so much access? Well, in my experience, it's a good question. The access is really overwhelming. So for a very long time, I I knew 
what I really wanted to do with my life. And then a big reason I started this podcast is because I didn't think I was qualified to do it. So yeah. <laughs> I, but I was honed in as the thing. And I was like, I'm very passionate about this thing. And I can go and search. I can go to the library, read books. I can ask people about this one thing that I'm really interested in and learn more about it. And I can volunteer or what have you. Now though, with all of this access, even I, when I was so steadfast in what I wanted, it's it's kind of now getting blurry of like, oh, but maybe I want this. Maybe I actually want to learn more about this. And as you said, like you can't become a master if you're doing like seven to 12 things. Yeah. But I have a hard time saying, oh, like I'm going to set that aside, even though that's really cool because I have this like one vision that I want my life to be. So I think it's just the simplest terms is the distraction of you can kind of grab this, you can grab this, you can grab yeah. this, but then you're doing so many things that you might lose out on opportunities for the one thing because you are so focused on it. Um, and then you are just, you have your hand in a million things, which is fun, but yeah. where's the growth in that <laughs> besides, besides like you can try out a bunch of things, but to grow in something you focus, right? Yeah. So it's like the the focus for me is hard and I can only imagine for younger generations or people that are not quite sure exactly what they wanted before or what they wanted out of life or even out mm. of an endeavor. That I think is, it just gets really muddied. And the the upside of that though, is that when you find your focus, there's like insane amount, insane amount of resources. Yeah. And I would say there's probably an advantage of maybe going to school for something now. It's like you have a very strict focus and everybody around you has that focus, like mm. your professors or what have you, um, or your teachers. And it's a little easier to stay on track. And then you have all these resources to dive into. So people on YouTube that are masters or or that have been like doing that one thing for a very long time and have become extremely good at it. You know, it's like it can get really, really fuzzy and then it can get very clear. But getting clear is harder, if that makes yeah. sense. That's interesting. Getting clear is harder. Can you explain that a little bit more? I mean, I think I know what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. The way I think of it is because there are so many distractions and even if you really want to get really good at something, it's hard to stay in the focus because mm. you could say, oh, say you want to get really good at, I don't even know, like you're like, I want to start rock climbing. So I'm going to yeah. rock climb in the gym and then I'm going to rock climb outside. And you really want to get very good at rock climbing. But then somebody comes across your path or you're down like a YouTube rabbit hole of rock climbing and you see that people are also out there ice climbing. Yeah. And it's kind of like similar technique, but it's a very different sport. And so you're like, oh, I could actually try that too. So maybe you get into ice climbing too, but then you're rock climbing. You're not going to excel. Maybe there's some transferable stuff, but it's like excelling in that one thing might take a little bit longer because you're trying to dip into other hobbies too. So I think that's like the clarity I'm thinking of. It's like so much is going on that you're like, oh, I want to try this and I want to try this and I want to try this. But, yeah. And none of it's, a, it's not like a bad thing. But to me, it's just harder to focus on the one thing that I want to get really good at because I get like, <laughs> it's like candy. You're like, oh, but I want to try that and I want to try yeah. that, you know? Does does having all of this, I'm just curious, does having all this information sometimes create a false sense of expertise among people? Um, that's interesting because a lot of what I evangelize is expertise doesn't have to be the expertise that we think it is. It's like expertise doesn't have to be that you have the degree in it. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if you're a doctor or you're pre performing heart surgery, please have an expertise and be a doctor. <laughs> but <laughs> otherwise, it's like expertise can be so many different things. And it can mean so many different things to somebody. So it's like, I don't want to turn somebody off from not doing something because they're not an expert in it, you know? And from there, if you want to get 
better at something and focusing on it. Maybe don't reach for being an expert, but reach for knowledge and then maybe expertise comes along with it. But yeah, expertise is like, I think it's just a scary word for me because I'm not an expert in anything, but I like to consider myself pretty darn good at some things. But if I'm an expert, it's almost like I'm talking myself too highly. (laughs) I don't Mm, know. Interesting. Well, in a related thing, I think these are just questions. I yeah, no, that's I'm a just, really good you know, question. I, what's the cutoff of uh, this? Is getting deep here. I mean, this is why we're back talking again. <laughs> like, what's the cutoff between knowing something decently well and providing that information to other people, and maybe knowing something and then like, well, this is dangerous to be telling other people. I may know this well, but there there needs to be a cutoff here where I need to have some regulation in my thoughts and ideas and spreading this information. The cutoff for me and the way I think of a cutoff would be if pushing something on somebody could be harmful to Mm. them or harmful to people around them. So a cutoff would be please don't go perform open heart surgery on your friend because you are not a doctor. That's extreme. I don't know anybody outside of a serial killer that would do that. Right. And it's it's, not, most people know better than that. Most people know better than that. But dialing that way back, if you are, oh man, it could get even deeper into like, if you really do not understand a lot about the plight of maybe even a religious group or a racial group of people and you want to learn more about it and get more involved in something. But let's say like you can't come as an expert on something that hurt a lot of people like World War II camps, you know, for like Jewish people and what have you. Like there's a level of expertise or a level of like pushing on that I think the boundaries would be this person probably just innately knows more about this topic or this person like you shouldn't be directly preaching to somebody about something that you really don't know anything about because historically you can't. Yeah. So that's, and that's probably a whole conversation in itself. And I'm not (laughs) even sure if I answered your question, but it's like, Kind of like tread the line with respect to culture and Mm. all of that. Um, And that's honestly not something that I ever really get into. And that's very interesting to even think about. It's like, yeah, you can do whatever you want and be an expert or try to be an expert, reach for expertise in these things. But yeah, tread with caution for some things that you really don't know much about and you might never. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think it's an interesting conversation because I like to have I like to postulate things and talk about things that I think just aren't discussed. Yep. And maybe it's like a deeper level of critical thinking. And I think okay, it's obvious that you should not be opening someone up and moving their organs in different places, you know, and you know, <laughs> doing retraction of their uh, rib cage and things that, I mean, this is like obvious to 99% of humans outside of really crazy folks. But I think there's, there's the obvious part and then there's the not so obvious level mm-hmm. of information that it seems, okay. So in my industry and in the general health and wellness industry, this is always an issue with like, uh, nutritional information, right? Um, Oh, you know, where you're, you're maybe not a registered dietitian. You don't have this rigorous level or potentially rigorous level of, of tests and number of hours to meet contact time versus someone who's just a nutritionist and they have a lot of ideas and maybe their idea about food is based off of their own personal experiences. It gets very shaky because there's some legality to this and what would a reasonably prudent person in this profession provide information wise this goes to the exercise professional as well so in this work it's shaky like well what level is just your personal experience and information does that that validate you to tell someone this information which potentially could be harmful 
But on the flip side, even if you have a lot of education, maybe that's also limiting your ability to have other skill sets to understand uh-huh. people too. So I just think it's like a shaky line with it. Yeah. A lot of people cross over all the time without thinking of the consequences of it. I love that example because there is something very related to that that I toe the line on for my my uh, podcast and especially my presence on Instagram. So my presence on, presence on Instagram is mostly I'm pursuing a lot of outdoor activities um, and I don't have a background in athletics or anything. And so that's kind of like I'm pursuing mountain climbing and ultra marathons. And I'm like, I was never a runner. I didn't like I'd get out of the mile anytime I could in high school. Yeah. You know, I was like allergic to being <laughs> I was allergic <laughs> to running. Um, and now I'm running like 30 miles. But the line that I'm towing with that is I love to encourage people to do that same thing if they really want to start running. But what I'm doing is because of my body and where I'm starting from. I'm not writing you a prescription of exactly how to start running because I'm I'm wary of saying because it works for my body, it's going to work for somebody else's yeah. body. And I definitely stay away from nutrition. Nobody's asked me, but I think it's only a matter of time before somebody's like, what do you eat in a day Yeah, to be able to run like this? And it's like, I don't know if I would ever share that because my calorie intake is much different than your calorie intake. And like what I need in my physique as in protein, it's so much different. Um, but I'm, that's a really good point. I'm so afraid of saying this is exactly what worked for me and this is my what my base level of training is like, this is my resting heart rate. This is like my zone one, zone two, cause it's different right. from person to person. Yeah. So it's, yeah, that's a really good point of, I don't think I would ever, ever say, Hey, this is exactly what you should strive for. It's kind of like reach for this goal and like, please talk to a professional in terms of exactly yeah. what your zones are and how you should be fueling. Um, and as like a nutrition background. I can only imagine because people probably ask you very in depth and you're like, I don't know your exact, you know, (laughs) needs as a person. Yeah. This is the whole thing. Like if you are out with people and they find out, you know, what you do for a living, whether you're in a dietitian, you're a fitness professional, whatever it is, immediately people want an answer about Mm -hmm. what should I be doing? And I always tell people I have no clue. And they go, how do you, what you, this is what you do. I'm like, yeah, but I don't know you. I haven't sat down and done a consultation with you. I don't understand all of the different variables that make up your health and wellness situation. I have yep. to know those so I can start building a picture of what it actually is. Anybody who tells you after meeting you for like 10 minutes, here's what you need to do. Is, this is not good. <laughs> they, mm-hmm. don't, they don't know anything about you. They're giving you a cookie cutter track home type situation here. I mean, it's like, you know, and uh, so I think we just get into a weird situation um, sometimes of you get like for what you're doing, it sounds like it's more of like, I'm just trying to show people my journey, inspiring people. Hey, this is, you can do this. That's a wonderful thing, but it becomes dicey when people cross over that line of Mm -hmm. I'm now providing you nutritional information running programs. I'm providing you exercise. It's like, okay, just provide a disclaimer. I am not a professional in this area. You know, yeah, these are just I my put that on a lot of my stuff. Exactly. It's like yeah. in even like little text in the beginning of a story where it's like, this was my run today. And then I show, yeah. you know, maybe like my, my heart rate on my watch or something. And it's like, this is for my body. Like, yeah. please do not take this as something that you should be at or what have you. And it's like, I've been running for a couple of years now. It's going to yeah. be a little different than yours. And there's people that have been running for literally since high school and they're my age. So yeah. theirs is much different than mine. You know, it's like comparison also you, you should just stay away from. Yeah. But in comparison, especially when it comes to health, that's incredibly important. Yeah. And I would, I don't even know if I, even if I had a degree in like a physiology, I don't think I'd even do it. Yeah. It's interesting. I think it's a two-sided conversation, maybe more than that, because there's the kind of armchair uh, Mm. 
expertise. And then there's also an attack against expertise. Like, well, just because you have a lot of education doesn't mean you always know what you're talking about. And there's that level too of being so um, hyper-focused in one area that yeah. you may have, this happens with doctors all the time. Like you may be hyper-focused on gastroenterology, but not understand anything what happens to brain injuries. I mean, it's just not what you t were taught. You know, it's a very specialized yeah. part. So your doctor does not know everything, but they know a lot about one thing generally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, it's up to people to have to disseminate and have good discernment about these things. Yeah. Um, and, and often comes down to that. And a lot of people just don't have very good discernment. And this, and you go down these rabbit holes of someone telling you something. And often if someone makes something sound really intelligent, it could be very convincing too. There's a lot of very convincing people out there. <laughs> there's definitely a lot <laughs> Especially of- Especially in social media. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so there's a lot of uh, motives and things of that nature. But I wanted to ask too was, what have you learned the most about yourself through these 50 plus episodes? That all of the limitations are perceived. Hmm. And with that, I mean, if I really want to do something, even though I didn't do it in the past, even though I didn't go to school for it. I can learn more about that thing with the resources that we have, and I can take steps to pursue that thing because of these resources. And it has nothing to do with my prior experience. My prior experience feeds into these new things more than I thought they did hmm. too. And that's one thing that I've really loved learning about, especially with the people that I have on is they're doing something completely different than maybe they did go to school for, or they completely changed careers. Um, like there, I had this one lovely woman on Liz Shipton and she is sailing around the world with no prior sailing experience Wow! with her boyfriend. And she also went to, she was a uh, software developer in Silicon Valley and she just went to a coding boot camp. She didn't have a CS degree or anything. And she is exactly the type of people that I'm like, you come tell me your story, come talk yeah. about this, because it doesn't make any sense to a lot of people that are like, we need to go to school for this, or you need to, to sail around the world, you need a lot of experience. It's like, you probably should understand when a storm's coming, but <laughs> like, nautical information. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But you can also just like look that up on a weather app, you know, like a very good one. You might have to pay for it. But the thing is, it's so many things that you've done before are transferable to what you want to do now. And it's you, you don't always realize it until yeah. you talk to somebody about it. And then I'm sometimes drawing the lines for those people. And I'm like, you know, being a, you know, a, in marketing in a corporate setting sets you up for being a CEO of your own company way, way more than you think it does. You know, with just like all of those skills that you've learned from being in corporate, all of those skills yeah. that you learn from relating to people and developing something that people want to buy. Um, it's an, it's just fascinating learning all about transferable skills and how they apply to my life. And I can seriously do just about anything I really want to if I want to apply myself. And it has nothing to do with what I've done before. Yeah. It's really cool. Like I can now be a runner and I never was right. a runner before. It was interesting about that. See, I always see these in like in different dimensions of all these things. Like I, I, I was like, I'm a, I'm a big like tearing person about mm. a lot of stuff. So like, I believe someone could be like become a runner for sure. Like almost anyone could become a runner. It's amazing. Question is, there's a level to that. Now, mm -hmm. you can still practice a lot and be and really do put in a lot of volume and you may never be actually good at it. Like in terms oh, of like I know. a certain Dr. level D. of like, <laughs> I like know. you could be like what I mean good is and good in relation to the criteria for let's say um if this was a Olympic level athlete, this was a collegiate level person, 
This was someone who was like a lower level, collegiate level person, a, high, a good high school runner, a recreational runner. Sometimes I think we tell people they can do stuff, but we don't tell them like, hey, you may do this. There's a good chance you won't be the best at it. You'll just be yeah. you know, better at it. And uh, I like to tear those things. I'm like, yes, anybody could be a runner, but you may not. Yeah. It's OK if you're not the best runner. It's totally OK. Like it's just about becoming more proficient. And some people, these amazing stories, they turn on this green light and they become incredible at it as something they yeah. never knew they were good at. There's different levels. I think sometimes we don't give people good expectations about what they will become when they start something. It's like you maybe start to play the guitar. It doesn't mean you're going to be Jimi Hendrix. You know, I mean, maybe. Yeah. But it's a good shot. You're not. <laughs> you're going to be better at One it. in a million. Yeah. Know? Like yeah. <laughs> within a context here, like the goal is to get better. Keep getting better. You know. Yeah, that's so important because another big thing I've learned is I'm only in competition with myself. Yeah. Everything is just be better than yesterday. Don't be better than the other person. When yeah. I did my first ultra in June of this year, I was literally, Dr. D, the last one across that finish mm -hmm. line. I still made it you across it. the finish line. Yeah. It took me eight and a half hours, but I still got a bottle of wine because I was the last one. They still give out prizes for the last one. Okay, you one. get wine for running, okay? <laughs> you know, and like, for the they wine. are very kind, everybody out there. Yeah. But the thing is, is like, and everybody is always so supportive too. I mean, yeah. the running community is pretty darn supportive, which is another for reason sure. to get into it. But I will never probably be the first person. Now that I've been doing it more, I'm like, I would yeah. love to top five someday, but I'm a long ways from it. And that's right. okay. Cause right. you find so much about yourself and all of this stuff and you're not competing with anybody but yourself. Yeah. And be kind to yourself because your body's amazing, but it also is, it's just trying to adapt physically like a body can, right? Like our mentals and our body yes. are kind of sometimes a little disconnected. <laughs> yes. Most definitely. Running's an interesting one. I was a collegiate track and field athlete. I've run most of my life. Oh, you're probably very fast. I know all about <laughs> I once was very fast. Once was. Uh, <laughs> I have no delusions of like, oh, yeah, I'm still really fast. No. I mean, that was like 25 years ago. <laughs> I was like, uh, and not training for it. You know, I was like, there's an adaptation to training that occurs. You have to train. But uh, I was a good runner. I was not a great runner. But, um, but you know, if you get the thing, I look at it as like you're improving all the systems of your body. You know, yeah. You're increasing a lot of different things that are happening inside your body. You know, your stroke volume is getting better, your cardiac output, your ability to increase your oxygen uptake changes, gets better. All these wonderful things that actually help you as a human yeah. to live are, are great products of running and any type of especially steady state, you know, exercise, you know, type of thing. So I tend to focus on that with people. And, you know, if you want to compete, that's great. Compete. But, uh, you're going to know, once you get into the arena of competition, you will know very quickly where you stand. Very quickly. <laughs> It'll be very humbling. <laughs> yeah, it's very different than being a recreational exerciser. That yeah. you're often never tested and you don't know where you stand. But once yeah. you get into the competition arena, you will know very quickly how good you are, how good you're not in, in relation. Exactly. So you got to be careful about where you want to take it for that, you know? Yeah, like I know I'll never be... I think the top ultra marathon woman is Courtney DeWalter, I think mm -hmm. is her last name. Yeah. And I know like she's built very different than me. Sure. <laughs> like, in a lot of ways, mentally, physically. And I and a beautiful thing about, yeah, like not competing but with anybody but yourself and understanding that once you get into like the competition part of it, even yeah. with other people, like you're in a race, somebody's gonna place first. Mm -hmm. But having somebody to look up to like Courtney, it's like, I'll never reach that. But gosh, like I could learn so much from the mental state that she talks about yeah. that she gets into because we all have our own battles when we're running yeah. or when we're in a difficult spot in our life. So learning about how other people overcome really difficult emotional and mental barriers is so cool. And another reason to just keep researching cool people and try and keep trying to do try. something. Yeah. 
Yeah, don't be discouraged if you're not winning these races or you're not placing a certain thing. Your goal is to get better. It's just 100%. to improve and, and helps you mentally, socially, emotionally. And, um, you know, running is also often very meditative, um, yeah. especially done at steady state levels, at high intensity levels, just painful. Um, but it's mainly, but there is a, a lot of people getting to running because of the community and because at a steady state, uh, lower intensity level, it can be very meditative and it can be very yep. mind cleansing and it's very focus oriented where it's just that going on, which is actually yeah. on a side note, this is going to sound crazy to probably most people who are going to listen to this. Because when I was at a conference speaking on something like this, it was like an audible gasp from the audience when I said this. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to tell you something crazy. I'm going to tell you something that's going to blow your mind because you're in this age group. I'm going to recommend when you run to run without music. Ah. And everybody, <gasps> and I said, I'm going to recommend Never. this. I know. And I was like, now, what I'm going to recommend this from an exercise professional's point of view is just taper down. Don't go cold turkey. Uh -huh. Listen to it the whole time. Maybe do instead of like if you're going on like a 30 minute run, whatever, you know, do it for 28 minutes and just keep working yourself down. I said, you're going to think it's hard, but here's the point. You're going to you're going to know your body way better by listening to it without distraction. That's what all collegiate athletes, professional has. When they run, there's no music on when you're competing. And so if you, you, when you're training, there's no music on when you're, when you're training as a competitive athlete. You get into a pace. You, you understand the pace internally. You listen to your breathing. You hear the footsteps, the whole thing. It's a much more meditative experience than having something going into your ears. Trust me. Trust me. Well, it works. It works. I'm telling you, it's you're just. You're also hard. telling me that I have to be alone with my thoughts. <laughs> Correct, and that is awesome. But the thing is, if you're doing something, running in itself is a distraction. Yeah. And, and then getting in line, when with your heart rate, with your breathing, with your existence, those thoughts will also not be there the way they normally are. With That's them. a really good point. You're just you're tuning in. You're tuning you're in tuning something in. else. Yes. Yeah. I can't believe I'm saying this right now because when I was growing up, this was never <laughs> anything I had to say to anyone when I was in oh. my twenties. But when I, I mean, I nobody's tell running now, with their Walkman because the no, CDs it's don't. ridiculous. It's like skipping and stuff. You know, it's yeah. all ridiculous. You know, you but, can't even walk with those things. Right. Walkman is, is not the correct way to label those. But we Anyways, took a turn yeah. because mm. this is like the whole thing: expertise and what's the cutoff. The cutoff was the iPod. Because yeah. when you had iPods, it was just music. And you could just, you maybe just had that. Once it became, I could check my email, I can check my text, I'm getting notified by things, popping up, buzzing, beeping sounds. All of a sudden, you don't just have one distraction, you have several distractions during your run. And then you okay. may take a break on your run and start checking things. I think this is uh, antithetical to what the actual process is. And very fascinating. Yeah, I'm telling you, I know I'm in a minority here, <laughs> but I'm I'm telling you, you will be in much more of a flow when you get into understanding how your body actually feels. All right. I've that. been running a lot recently and I've never done it without music, but I have a run schedule today, Dr. D. So what I will do is I will do it's two and a half miles. So maybe I'll try it for a mile. Yeah, don't go cold turkey. I would never recommend that. You're going to feel yeah. horrible. Like just like I'm going to give myself this amount of time to not and this amount of time too. And you're going to tell immediately it's going to feel weird. It's going to feel yeah. so weird. I'll message you right after. You like message how weird me. It is. Yeah, you message me. In fact, I want you to text me. I'm going to email you and give you my number. I want you to text me. I will. Me. <laughs> and like how did that feel? And it's going to feel weird, but you're also going to be more in tune with like your breathing. And your heart yeah. rate. And that is your music. That's the rhythm. Like It's a beautiful it's the, thing. Yes. Yes. I'm telling yes, you. Like, everybody's you trying like, to distract themselves. I don't get it. I'm like, it's okay to like be there, you know? Like I mean, I just like to distract myself from the pain. That's okay. You gotta be part of the pain. <laughs> Running you have is to really merge hard. with the pain. You gotta merge with it. You have to. All right. You have to. That's, All right, I'll do it. Pain is I'll part of it. life. It just is.
And especially when you're exercising and you're, and you're you know, you're doing something physical, it's just part of the process. You just have to accept it. it just oh, takes gosh. Time. <laughs> you're right. Like, I don't want to hear this. <laughs> I don't want to hear this. I'm like, all. are you like into Buddhism now? Like, is like no. suffering is just part of life? <laughs> I just, I think suffering is definitely somewhat part of yeah. being physically active. I'm not saying like the whole thing, because I have my profession, everybody's do something you love. I'm like, okay, well, does that, if you love something, that's great, but does it improve you? A lot of time yep. improvement is uncomfortable. And especially physically, in order to improve, you have to have a stimulus that's greater than what you're used to. That's uncomfortable. Yeah. It's okay. I mean, I feel like I tout all the time. Yeah. And if anybody on here is actually going to check out my Instagram, they're going to be like, she tells us all the time to get uncomfortable. Like uncomfortable is where you change. And the thing is, is you always will be uncomfortable. You just have to learn to live with it. So like whatever you're doing and that's, I will die on that hill. But do I want to be uncomfortable? No. (laughs) I'll tell you to be uncomfortable, but not for me. It's not (laughs) for me. Not me. Yeah. You're like, I, I'm not changing my running. That's not happening. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I'll give it a shot for a mile. I will. I don't know. It's just something to think about. You know, I will. Like, uh, there's a great community and running and things. But one of the most beautiful things I'm telling you, again, this is going to sound weird if you haven't done this before. But if you ever go to a, a very high level, even like a moderate level track and field practice, running practice with a bunch of people, watching people run in herds and groups, it is amazing because they're yeah. all in sync with each other and the footsteps yeah. and the movement and the and the heartbeats and the breathing and everybody starts syncing together. You get this feeling. That's how I learned how to run. I never That's learned how to run with music. That's music in itself. That's music. Yeah. Like you got to trust that you're creating your own music and you have to, what's that line of where the music is uh, positive? Because we know through research that a certain beats per minute is positive for motivating people to exercise. But once you reach a certain level of BPMs and a certain level of intensity that you're training, the music is irrelevant at that point. So is it like positive or is it a crutch for you to Mm. not face these other things? Running, I've known so many runners my whole life, life. A lot of runners, especially super distance runners, are running away from some demons and different things. They're trying to like run it away from them you know like yeah run this out of my body type of thing i mean i've gotten to the crazy point where i run when i'm stressed i'm like what's happened to me (laughs) (laughs) it's a binky on some level you know it's a pacifier but i think to get closer to the experience is to like really meet it is to really love that i love that i mean when i do mountaineering stuff it's like you do you're all especially on a rope team you're all at the same pace yeah. All it is is crampons and snow, and yeah. it is like very rhythmic, and that's calming. And all it is is like absolute silence. Otherwise, because you're, you know, like nine, ten thousand feet on a mountain. Yeah. So it's like it's incredible. But I would never do that at sea level. But now I'll give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like hiking. I mean, ever I, mean, yeah. I like hiking, but I always find it weird when I do a hike and someone's just blasting music on the hiking trail or something oh i hate that i'm like why do you what are you doing like sometimes i think they're afraid of bears or something and they maybe want, but yeah i mean but like just don't just be there hear the wind rustling the trees yeah. you know feel the, the the gravel the sound of the ground i'm very much into like that type of stuff like when i train and i train hard especially I like knowing that my rib rib cage is expanding dramatically. My breath is like overwhelming. Like I really Mm. tap into that and I meet the discomfort. I think our society is focused on limiting discomfort all the time. And I'm not a fan of that. I'm like, listen, this is a temporary feeling I'm going to have. I might as well just embrace it. You know, And you're going to move past it. And then guess what? That temporary discomfort's not going to be as heavy next time. It's still going to be there, but you're going to, cause you're going to learn more about how to go over it. I love that. Yeah. And the change and the improvement in something, maybe you're not qualified. You would think you're not qualified in happens when you're actually, especially physically happens when you're not doing the actual thing. Like when you run and you increase the mileage, you increase the intensity, all this stuff, the change happens during the recovery portion. 
the running it is does. just a vehicle for beating you up to get to the next stage. I would think. <laughs> There's obviously and a lot of benefits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's uh I think we're just uh trying to be as comfortable as possible and you uh, you have to be willing to like meet the discomfort. You do. You have to be you have to find the comfort and the discomfort because that's actually a really beautiful place to be. Yeah. I was telling you like, this. This sucks, but I can do it. Yeah. When people ask me, what do you what do you like to do for exercise? I was like, I'm a, I wouldn't say I like to do anything. Um like I I I wouldn't say I even enjoy exercising. I was like, I I look at it as a process to help me get better and that it's uncomfortable and I'm just meeting it each mm-hmm. time because I know it's gonna help me. I feel the internal systems, I know what's happening, I know what's gonna change. I know how I feel mentally uh, mm-hmm. with it. I look at it as uh, a, a very necessary thing to do that's not necessarily enjoyable, but it, it certainly, um, it, it's a test for me. It uh, really you gotta is. You test yourself regularly. And if it's always about being comfortable, you're just never testing yourself ever. Yeah. And there's addiction in the growth, I will tell you. Once you're yeah. like, I ran that mile a little faster than last <laughs> yeah. time. Or like this hike, I remember I wanted to yeet myself off the mountain and now I made it to the top yeah. without crying. Like that's, <laughs> that's amazing growth. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The accomplishment, right? When you start yep. accomplishing, that accomplishment is a drug in many ways. It's, uh, it's, it's that hit that you're yeah. looking for. It's like, oh, I did that. Well, what else can I do? Yeah, it's <laughs> like, it's the whole type two fun. It's only fun afterwards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you got to meet yourself. So this is my advice. Shocking. Now, like, <laughs> may mix in some music, some not, but you'll be like, you'll you'll know. Like if somebody said, Darian, go out and run a 200 at a 30 second pace. I don't need a watch for that. I don't need anything. I could just do it because I know what that feels like internally. And that is a level of mastery of your internal systems. Of like, yeah. I know what my breathing is like, what my heart rate is like, how my legs feel when I do this type of thing. And yeah. if we're more connected to that, you'll be more connected to yourself. That's really the Love point. It. Don't drown out your demons. Find them, talk to them, work with them. Yeah. And and you know what? Question yourself. Yeah. That's another thing. I think as part of it is like doing something new or trying something new and continue that is like progress is not linear. And some days it's going to feel like it's not going well. It's okay. Many <laughs> yeah. days. <laughs> yeah. Many days. It's just not going well. Oh, you know. yeah. Sometimes I'm shocked I stick with things. But when you do, <laughs> yeah. and it's like, and then you finally come, you, you come to, you know, and you're like, wait yeah. a second, this is great. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's very deep. Okay. <laughs> I know. I just, uh, I try to see it a different way, especially with exercise. I try to have a very different mentality to it and just be like, some of these runs are going to feel terrible. Let's just take the yeah. running. Some of it's not, you're going to feel, not going to feel optimal every time you go out and run. Some days you're going to feel like you run forever. Yeah. I, I find those are far and few between. Oh uh, yeah. You know, you're going to feel yep. average and that's okay. You know, it's just part of the process, but I th- it's good to test yourself and be like, can I actually do this? Like get to the point where you're like, I'm questioning myself. That's an interesting place to be. It really is. And that's a very powerful place yeah. mentally yes. because then you talk to yourself and you get through it usually. Yeah. And it is incredible. And you can get through it even if you feel like you can't, like you absolutely yeah. can. You're if I can run, anybody can run. Very, very true. <laughs> You're like, listen, I'm setting the tone here. If I could do it. <laughs> anybody, I'm serious. Like I was never a runner. And if I can do it, they can do it. And yeah, I have asthma. Yeah. Like do it. Yeah, it's inspiring. It's definitely inspiring. Um, but it's, I mean, you could take this to almost anything, you know, it's you like, can. and I think we, we romanticize this too in movies or it's a, if it's a sports movie and the boxer comes out for the next round and it's like, can he come back out again? Can you get yeah. back off the mat again? We push this in society, this keep getting up, keep getting up. Yeah. That should be applied to almost everything. Really and true. Run like Rocky. Run like Rocky. Rocky. Yeah. Rocky had no music. He was just out there running, man. You're right. <laughs> Upstairs. All Upstairs. right. Upstairs. Yeah. Yeah. And you can do it. 
you can. Like you said, it's like I'll be with my thoughts. But then the second level is that is the like you said, the pain. And it's like, well, I just want to like not feel bad. I'm like, no, no, no. My approach is like, you gotta jump into feeling bad. <laughs> like, Get into know, the like, pain cave. Yeah. You, gotta, you, you we actually know there's been some great research on this with runners, especially and endurance athletes, that the best endurance athletes are the ones who handle suffering the best. Oh. Right, they're good at coping with suffering. This is the difference between greatness and not even physically. Like the that's the difference between like greatness and just being okay, is the ability yeah. to suffer and to handle pain more effectively. The yeah. men- mentality, you know, love it and not try to avoid it. Right. So you got to jump in. If you're using music as a way to not feel pain, it's like well, you're never build- building that hardiness. The toughness, there's a lot of toughness to a lot of things that are built by just meeting the pain, Uh you know, like, so I think a lot of modern people are trying not to do that. They're like, I just, I want this to be like very fun for me, (laughs) like, but I want to improve. I'm like, okay, improvement and fun, you can to a point. And then there's going to be another level that's going to be excruciating. You just have to be okay with it, you know? Yeah, man, that's so good. Okay. I have a lot of great content idea now. A great too, content, is, yeah. Yes, but this has been so amazing for me too because I avoid I avoid pain a lot, and I know yeah. that I I know that I shouldn't, and that's how you get better. It is, and you it's, can because yeah. it's scary. It's yeah. scary. It's like conflict with a a partner. Yeah, a significant other. Like a lot of people avoid the confrontation, and uh, my wife knows this. I I can say this. I always say like. I like the conflict when we have it between us because we're getting down to the nitty gritty, to the pain. Yeah. We got to, we got to meet the the conflict we're having head on. Right. We can't like just sweep it under the rug. Yeah. And you always propel forward in some direction when you meet the conflict. So these are lessons that are carried into all, all areas. What areas are you avoiding the pain or are you masking it? Running is just one version of it. There's next it's, in a lot of things in life. Yeah. It is. And yeah, your personal relationships and your career and other hobbies. Yeah. Like how many times you put something down and walked out of the room. Right. Like metaphorically, you yeah. know? Yeah. It's too hard. This is painful. You know, why can't yeah. everything just be fun? I'm like, this isn't utopia. Like, <laughs> like life is not that. <laughs> it's just a design. It's not. I mean, yeah. But that's also what makes it beautiful. Yeah. Like, Without suffering, it would be very boring. Right. <laughs> Nobody have anything to talk about or cry. We're about. trying really hard to limit it, though. I'm telling you right now, yeah, <laughs> like making really life not. real convenient. And in developed countries, we're making life very convenient for people. We really and, uh, are. I remember one time I was cutting my grass in Washington State, and one of my neighbors was like, uh, "Well, you should put the bag on the end of it, so you're not having to rake up." I said, "No, I do that on purpose." I said, because I like the effort that raking the lawn gives me. It's an extra amount of stimulus and tension to it. It's kind of a workout. You know, when you rake a lawn, a large yawn, it's a lot of effort in the leaves mm-hmm. and everything. The machine's doing most of the work if I have the bag on. And he just mm-hmm. was like, what? Why would you make it harder? I'm like, <laughs> see what I mean? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> why are we doing this all the time? Yeah. You know, this Man. I know it's a psychotic approach. It's definitely different from most people I know. <laughs> I know this. I'm very aware of my mentality about it. But try it. Definitely try, try it. it. I want to hear about it, Courtney. Okay, uh, I this will. Run and uh, I mean, the it's today. Truth. I'll let you know. Okay. I want the honest truth. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I threw myself into traffic now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Never know. I mean, but- I think it'll be really nice. We'll see. We will definitely see. I'm, I'm going to guess it's going to be uncomfortable initially. I think it will. I was trying to sugarcoat it. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> it's I be expect uncomfortability. Hard. I like expect that. And, yeah. uh, but if you stick with it, eventually you'll probably find a lot of freedom, honestly, and not being connected to it. Okay. You're let's like, go. I'm skeptical. Okay. Let's. <laughs> I will give it a shot for you. But. Okay. You're like, normally if someone told me this, I'd be like, no way. No yeah. way. 
<laughs> you're crazy. <laughs> yeah, you're like, mm, I need my music. I'm not going to, no, I'm going to listen to a podcast, whatever. I, no. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll give it a shot. We'll see. That's, that's all you can great. do. Growth. Well, growth. Right. And that's what's happening with your podcast. And I would love for you to tell everyone how they can connect with your podcast and, and uh, the more episodes you have coming up. Yeah. So right now I'm putting out once a month, the first Thursday of every month. So the next one will be next Thursday. I do bonus episodes too. So one came out last Thursday. Um, and I'm at like around 52 episodes. You can find the whole catalog at my website, you're not qualified podcast.com. And I'm most active on Instagram for engagement. You can follow my now probably even more painful running journey without music. <laughs> um, and that's at YNQPod. <laughs> Wonderful. Courtney, uh, I seriously enjoy talking to you. You make it easy. Very easy. Oh, thank you. You too. You're very fun. And you awesome. have very good questions. Like I thank have not you. philosophically thought like that in a long time. <laughs> That's my goal with these things is like, all right, let's go deeper and uh, mm. see what we come up with. Right. You know, mm -hmm. love it. Thank you for having me again. Thank you, Courtney. I'll be in touch. All right.